All right, let's get this party started. All right, everybody, thank you for joining the Speaking Greeks podcast. Uh, this week we have David Sun. Um, some of you guys might know David Sun uh, from his podcast, The Trade Busters. And uh, let's jump right into it. I think that uh, a lot of people have heard your story and kind of know your background. For the people that don't, though, do you want to give like a 10,000 foot view on kind of like how you got started and interested in investing in the market in general, anything like that? Yeah, no, for sure. Thanks for the intro. And like I said, you can find my stuff on you know Tasty Trade, on my podcast and everything. So 10,000 foot view is started trading or got into the market just randomly in grad school uh just watching cnbc mad money and uh one of my friends there happened to be in the options he taught me options from the basics so did stuff on my own for a few years until 2017 found tasty trade tasty trade kind of exploded the uh the learning curve started joining online facebook groups you know watching tasty trade learning from other people online did that for a couple of years, uh, launched my first hedge fund in late 2018, uh, launched my second hedge fund in early 2021, and all the meanwhile, still engaging and participating in online groups, uh, posting some of my strategies, my trades, essays, started my podcast, and uh, started my Discord group, and here we are. So that's all of that and about... You know, the last eight or nine years, but the, the, the acceleration was definitely in that last, you know, 2017 plus. And I guess that's how learning curves always go. Yeah, they're kind of exponential. Um, so going back to whenever your friend introduced you to options, uh, I know that there's a common theme I've been discovering where people are being introduced to options via the famous like Robin Hood, you know, everybody yellowing long. Off. Is that the same story for you? Is that kind of your introduction to options was the long FDs or is it more, was there always structure from day one? You know what? It's funny because there was no <laughs> Robin Hood back then. I mean, this was 2008, 2009. Okay. So, and, and oh, actually okay. my friend, he taught me from selling options. So I learned it from the get go from an option seller. I think the only thing I tried what, as a buyer, cause when I first learned it, you know, I bought a, a book called the options playbook and that's actually the only book I've really read on options. And, you know, they have all different plays and they kind of break it down and like have risk graphs and it's, it's, it makes it a little more approachable. <laughs> my, my only long option play was a earnings play and I bought a long straddle on Apple <laughs> right before earnings. <laughs> I was like, oh, you know, <laughs> if it goes up or down, we're going to make money and earnings and moves and you know how that goes. So that's the only thing I did after that. I just and then I just sold puts for like a couple of years after that. And that was and I say this too, you know, it's it's sometimes not great if things work out right away because remember this was 2000, right after the crash, you know, the great financial um, crisis. And then like everything was going up. So <laughs> selling puts worked well for two years. Um, so that was not really learning much. It was just, I mean, got my feet wet and got engaged. But uh, obviously <laughs> selling puts work until it doesn't. And I'm talking about without any kind of risk management, just naively selling on whatever. Yeah, I think we talk about that a lot where you kind of have like where good things that happen to you in the market is actually kind of like the worst thing to happen to you when you're starting out. Because like you said, you know, like those long options play out well, then you kind of get bit by you bit the, you bit the forbidden fruit almost. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, so and then was or was the long straddle was that your introduction to like IV Crush or did you did it end up working out? For it you? did not work out, and that was my introduction to <laughs> IV Crush. And I was like, "Hey, what happened?" And he was like, "Well, IV Crushed." And at that point, I was like, <laughs> didn't really even care to understand that. And like, he tried to explain implied volatility and historical volatility, and there wasn't like nice slick platforms like nowadays where you can look at all these things and track. And it was like having to go online and like look things up and i was like forget it and i just like just started selling puts and it was like throwing darts you know at a dartboard and just picking like oh here's here's a tech stock here's a here's a finance stock here's a whatever stock and sell puts and i would literally go and i <laughs> i didn't pick by delta i picked by the percent return i wanted to get i wanted to get like two or three percent a month <laughs> so i would pick whatever strike gave me a premium of like that percent a month <laughs> that's how i did it it's that's super interesting though because i think when we like do the ten thousand foot view of like strategy 
you'll you still credit target and you still <laughs> no, do the so selling funny. puts. That, that's an interesting <laughs> connection you made. So yes, you're still selling puts and you're still credit targeting. So nothing's really changed, right? <laughs> yeah, that, we can say that, I guess. So yeah, so you have you said you have the, the hedge funds and again you have your show at the trade busters if people want to deep dive into the mechanics of the strategy but from an overall you want to go over kind of what your strategy is from like like i said like a higher perspective yeah i think more i guess more kind of philosophically my approach and it's just the idea of like, yeah first of all you know i'm not directional i look at just the statistics and the probabilities and i want to trade lots of occurrences and then so i have these ideas you know called credit targeting where I'm trying to sell the same amount of premium every single time, right? That, because I look at the credit more as a proxy for the size of the trade or the risk because I'm going to have a strict stop loss, right? Because when you have a stop loss and a profit take, you don't have to take a profit take, but essentially when you define the win size and you define the loss size, right? That kind of fixes your win loss ratio. Uh, some people call that the, the R factor. And once that's fixed, the only thing that remains to determine your expectancy, because expectancy is a function of the win rate, the win size, and the loss size, right? And we've just, like I said, fixed two of those variables. And so the only thing that remains is the win rate. And so if you pick or design strategies that have a win rate that's above a certain level, the expectancy would be positive, right? And if it's below that, it'll be negative, right? And so you do a lot of testing on different strategies, keeping in mind the rigid uh, management of the win loss and you know as long as your win rate is high enough you will make x amount and that kind of translates to the expectancy which is another way of saying if you have a strategies where you're selling premium your expectancy is essentially how much of your premium you actually keep or net right after factoring losses after factoring commissions after factoring slippage and so what you net is, or what you've captured you know I, I deem that the the premium capture rate or pcr so this idea of fixing the win loss and then distilling down to a strategy with a win rate that's high enough for positive expectancy i call that expectancy hacking so those two concepts of the expectancy hacking and the pcr that's kind of the fundamental approach of how i apply to all of my strategies and they don't have to apply only to you know the put selling like i do with the data engine or zero dte i mean they can really apply i mean the idea of like monitoring the win loss ratio and trying to keep that expectancy healthy that that really that just boils down to risk management i think that can really apply to a lot of different kind of trading strategies so let's talk about the credit as a proxy for risk because i think i'm i'm wondering if i may have been thinking about it incorrectly the whole time so uh you mentioned that okay so if we target credit and it's to control the uh the the damage that can be done and when we control that, it's a, it's a matter of win rate. Then. Yes. I always viewed it as, you know, I was always told or read that the markets are efficient. So I always viewed it as a dollar credit is going to have the same risk of being stopped out at, at any time during the day. At, you know, whether I sell it at 930 or I sell it at 330, that dollar credit carries that same amount of risk. Am I thinking about it no, inaccurately? No, when or... I say proxy for risk, I, I mean like the actual amount, right? Because if I sell a dollar and my stop is at $2, then my risk in practice is $2, right? So I meant risk in absolute terms, right? Because people talk about like yes. sizing in terms of buying power. But then if you don't understand leverage and different products, right? Uh, selling a futures contract outright will have the same buying power as like a naked put on Spire or something. I, I'm, I'm just making up random numbers. But like those two instruments can have very different sizes and the buying power might be similar but there's no way the actual risk in practice or risk in theory, in fact, is the same. And so uh, for me, because if I sell a premium, right, a dollar, and I know I'm going to take a profit at X, I'm going to take a loss at Y, I've defined for myself how much I want to win and how much I'm willing to lose. Gotcha, gotcha, okay. So you mentioned uh, the zero DTE and... There's a lot of different ways that there's a ton of zero DT strategies. So I don't want to dive into that, but speaking Greeks is really about the retail trader and their um, return on time. And I totally missed that. Your most recent episode is also about return on time and this great phrase that you coined uh, active passive investing. Right. 
weird. <laughs> Do you want to touch on active passive investing? Yeah, yeah. So the thing is, like, it, it, it's weird because for zero DTE, like, people gravitate towards this. I mean, I don't want to generalize, but like, for my impression is like the idea of zero DTE. It's it's a fast binary event. You 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 know, you get that instant um, gratification, right? And so you think you can make X amount and if I do this and I can, you know, make a thousand dollars a day or whatever it is and I can make, you know, so many thousand dollars a year. And what people don't realize is, and it depends on the strategy too, but like because of how leveraged zero DTE needs to be and how fast it moves, you really can't do this as like a set or forget, right? You have to be there. And even with the stop loss, right? You need to make sure that the stops work for one. And if they don't work, you got to intervene. And sometimes if something goes crazy, like <laughs> there's a bad fill and you got to call a trade bus or whatever, like you, you can't just walk away, right? Otherwise, you might come back and your account's, you know, <laughs> obliterated, right? So that's actually quite a bit more active than you think it is. Now, on the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, people don't want to trade. Uh, so, so that was an example just now of people thinking something is easy, but and when it's really not. Now, on the opposite end of the spectrum, you know, with something like Theta Engine, where you're selling 90 DT strategies, right? And it takes 21 days for a, a, a trade to hit profit or to hit a stop loss. And so you get this feeling that it's so slow. It takes so much work. I got to do all this trading and adjusting. But because something like a longer data strategy, you know, the gamma is lower, they, the trade moves slower. There are instances where you really can't just rely on the order execution, especially if you trade a, a liquid product like SPY. And so you don't you actually don't have to watch it, right? And it's true, you always have positions on, right? And I know people like zero DT because no overnight risk, right? But there's ways to manage overnight risk and keep that contained, right? So with 90, anything above technically anything that's not zero DT, you're gonna have overnight risk, right? And so 90 DT, like, oh, this is you know, so long, I'm gonna have positions on there for a long time and I gotta watch it. But because of, you know, various factors, you actually don't have to watch that closely, right? And think about a strategy like Data Engine where I say you put on a trade once a day, you spend a minute, you put on a stop loss, you know, a bracket order, walk away, right? And do that once a day, right? You're going to spend, what, two minutes to put on a trade, maybe five minutes to log it. And so even though there's positions always on, like, in fact, you actually spend a lot less time trading something like this, right? So it's actually quite a bit more passive then you would, you know, people might realize from the get-go. And so, yes, it's not buy and hold where you're doing nothing, right? You're actively managing stuff, but it's in a very passive manner. You're really not spending that much time. And that's kind of what I, what I take as passively active trading or passively active investing. Yeah, I think there is a misconception. And I think that's what attracts people to with the zero DT is like, yeah, there is the no overnight risk. And but I also think that there's like that uh hell of a lot of intraday risk, that, right? <laughs> yeah, there is, there is for sure. And I think that's the, that's where the, the misconception is, is whenever you say, even if you think of like the tasty way, you know, 45 DTE, you're you're thinking 45 days, like that sounds like a lot of work to manage. Or 90 days, that's a lot of work. But in reality, like you said, it seems like the longer days to expiration the less time i actually put in that's the idea yeah that that's definitely the goal i mean and and tasty obviously there's a lot of mixed messaging and because of people's experience and stuff and like how tasty might try to it, it seems like they want you to always spend time looking for trades or adjusting whatever but the philosophy really is they say outright we trade 45 days because gamma is slower you don't have to adjust as much right you end up doing a lot of trading because their method, you have to always kind of find new trades. And if you have a bunch of trades, you got to always scan them and adjust them. But the actual per trade doesn't take that much management, so to speak. Right, right. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And then there's like the conspiracies around fees right, and stuff right. and but i think that's a, i think that's a byproduct too of like the market makers are hunting my stops and like that sen- that self uh just that like self-centeredness i guess of of the trader yeah yeah makes sense um so to further on zero dt and like return on time uh zero dt usually like i said there's like a lot of strategies and they kind of cycle through like the flavors of the week right <laughs> yeah i was gonna say there's the jim, Ol- the jim olsen's right. iron fly there's jim olsen's iron fly there's tammy's iron condors 
There's uh, I don't even, the there's there's a couple different things. There's the mad dentist strategy, um, but I, I noticed that last week there was the big debate whether you go all in it open or if you open multiple tranches. And we had a discussion on return on time on that and about management because a lot of people that are into zero DT also are juggling a nine to five where they might get pulled away into a meeting that runs over and stops are firing off. So yeah. What's your, what's your thoughts on all in at the open versus tranching throughout the day? Yeah. So, you know, for us, we start out as just, you know, all in at the open, right? Because this trade is very sophisticated now and beginning, it had to start somewhere, right? We were just selling put credit spreads in the beginning nine thirty, 30 and like, see if it wins or loses and i I, you know i was had this discussion on uh, the discord the other day about how like the idea what what putting on multiple tranches is like you know trade small trade often if you can have instead of one large trade you do multiple ones it spreads out the risk a bit it makes the probabilities because you know the chance of you getting a stop on one trade right let's call it 50 50 or 60 40 but what is the chance of you getting stopped out 10 different trades in a row if you assume each trade has the same probability, so it's like 50% to the power of N, whatever that is, right? So it it should be very hard to have a full loss. And to be clear, when we're talking about multiple trades, your overall sizing must be the same, right? So if you're collecting $1,000 credit and you do 10 trades, you're not doing 10 $1,000 credit trades, you're doing 10 $100 credit trades. So your overall risk is the same. But because it's spread out and the likelihood of hitting a stop on all of them is lower, it's, lo- it's lower l- uh, likelihood of having a full loser. At the same time, it's low, li- low likelihood of having a full winner, right? So it cuts both ways. But um, the win rate suggests that your volatility of the PNL should be less, right? Because you're going to have, instead of like almost like a binary, all win, all loss, you have like 50% winners, 40% winners, 60% winners, and then your actual PNL will be something in between. And that, that sounds great on paper. And so I think a lot of people... Um, seeing some of us do that, we're kind of jumping in um, and just thinking like, oh, that's kind of the next great evolution. But I want to point out a couple of things was that in the long term, it's not that it's going to boost your P&L, right? Because remember, you're trading the same size. So it's one trade of $1,000 or 10 trades of 100. You're going to smooth out the, um, the volatility of the equity curve, but it's still a thousand dollars of premium per day that you're selling, right? And if you think you're going to capture X amount, then the overall profit is going to be the same. It's just going to be a bumpier ride or a smoother ride. And so the actual net benefit, the goal is not to boost that. So people may not realize that. I, I think some people might think that you're actually supposed to make more, right? So to be clear, you don't. And so that reduced volatility is in fact the main benefit. But what does that do? That means you have to be there and put on the multiple trades and manage the multiple positions. And sometimes your strikes overlap. You've got to make adjustments or edit the order or whatever. And so if you have a small account and you're only making whatever X dollars, right? Literally the added benefit of the lower volatility, that marginal benefit may not, it's going to be outweighed by the additional complexity in the time spent. And this is always the case of scaling anything, right? Uh, scaling a business or scaling as trading, right? In the beginning, if you're making X dollars and you know you have a day job or you think your time is worth so much, right? If you spend too much time, <laughs> you're gonna lose money in terms of like the value on time, right? It, obviously, when you have a large capital pool and you're making more money, then it makes sense to put in more time. And so you got to think about scaling your time and whether or not that additional benefit is actually worth, you know, whatever you're have to spend to put into it right and like i i always get a laugh whenever i post any kind of statistics anywhere because i track what my hourly rate would be i take my trading days times eight for an eight hour okay. work day and like what would my hourly rate be and like everybody always gives like the laugh react on facebook or whatever but it's a serious metric that i track because if i would make do better going and folding clothes at target then i should not be trading yeah that makes sense. I mean, there's obviously the educational component, right? In the beginning, everyone's there to learn and you want to start small and then scale up. That's a goal, right? But again, realistically, if, if, if you're only going to be trading a small account forever and not to say you shouldn't do it, but you may not, it may not be worth it to put all that extra effort when the marginal benefit may not be worth it. 
Yeah, right, right. Yep, the uh, return on time invested. And that's a pro- That's a metric um, that like no one. Well, I haven't seen one talk about right because there's like everyone always talking about. There's like so many ways of measuring return that you get confused, and it's like mixed message, like return on account. Return on capital, return on margin, return on buying power, and some of some of those are used to mean the same thing, and sometimes they're used to not mean the same thing, and so nobody really knows what anyone's doing online, but then no one's talking about return on time because like they just don't care. People are just drawn to like dollar marks, you know. Is it, is it the dream of the Wolf of Wall Street? Like I'm a day trader. Like the, so, the return on time is just kind of a missed a missed thought because. You're, they're they're buying into the dream of yachts and clicking buttons on a laptop to generate cash yeah, flow. Yeah, and that's why if you are trading that size of an account and making that much money and you're doing it full time, of course, right? Put all the time you want into it. And the dream, like you said, the flexibility, oh, you know, I can work X number of hours a day or, I, you know, sometimes I can just take off or don't work, right? And so you have that freedom if you have the account size and the experience to actually generate that income and just not lose all your money. Right. Understood. Gotcha. Um, so for, well, let's, let's see if there's any questions regarding like zero DT and then we can go about return on time on like the 90 DT theta sure. engine. And then we can take some other questions okay. from general. So if anybody has any questions so far on like zero DT and return on time, um, request to speak. And I can give you the floor. And I think you had a couple from the uh, the form you sent, right? Or, or I don't know if you want to save it until later. Yeah, yeah, okay. I have those. Yeah, yeah, I'll, get, I'll do that while someone thinks of a question. So one of them was, um, what does it mean to be a hedge fund manager? Is it family, public, et cetera? Oh, okay. So a hedge fund or the kind that we have, it's just a pooled investment. So it's private parties pooling their money together to invest you know, in this case, in the market or our strategy, right? Um, I don't know if people do kind of like real estate, these uh, syndications where you pool money and then buy like an apartment or something. It's the same kind of structure. It's a limited partnership. So that's the main thing. It's a pooled vehicle. Most of the partners are limited partners, meaning they just bring capital and uh, some subset of the members are the general partners and they manage the whole pool as one large pot and they collect the fee. Um so that's not quite the same as a family office because family office, is obviously somebody managing money for a single family, maybe multiple families. I don't know, but that's kind of all internal. Whereas we have external investors, but we do have a, it is a private offering and that's why um, we don't really talk about like specifics of like performance or the name of the fund or the, the, the details, like too detailed about the strategies, but yeah, it, it's, it's a private offering and it's a, set up as a limited partnership. All right, go ahead, Ben. Uh, ben has a question. I'm going to give him the floor here. Hey, Ben. Hey, guys. How's it going? Good. Uh, so I joined a little late, so I might have missed uh, this, but was just wondering on the zero DTE, are there any events that you skip over and don't trade? We personally don't. Uh, I know people skip you know fomc or like we had this the jackson hole event you know j- just recent so i'm sure that's kind of a uh fresh in everyone's minds but for us because we already trade very small um we don't you know even if we hit all our stops our loss is going to be not that big on any given day and we have looked at our statistics for those event days fomc either meetings or the minutes and uh, the expectancy does seem to be slightly lower than the other days, but it's still positive. So for us, skipping out on those days would literally just be leaving money on the table. So we haven't seen any data that compels us that we should skip those days. And for, I've said this been in the past because I, I believe that volatility and the event risk you know, is priced in, right? It's, it's supposed to be, right? And that's why most of the time people who want to trade earnings – they trade earnings because they believe the volatility is overstated, right? Those Fed days are just a binary event. And if you believe that generally the volatility is overstated, there sh- should still be positive expectancy trading those days. And to jump into, I personally, I also trade 
I still trade the FOMC days as well. Um, I just haven't saw enough data to sway me otherwise. I know that Option Omega has added the ability to blacklist dates, and I've yet to see anybody kind of prove one way or another. Um, and and then it, it kind of becomes like a slippery slope too. So like if we take out FOMC days, which are traditionally are a release of the previous month's meeting minutes, then – you know, when does it stop? So, for example, I think there's a speaker, I think, every day this week at Jackson Hole. You know, do we take off every day this week then? And, like, where do we draw the line? Like, that's kind of how I view it. Yeah, that's a good point. Do you trade Do you trade FOMC days? I usually do, but I trade uh, about half of the size I normally do. So you size down. Yep. Gotcha. Yeah, and I don't have any uh, clear data about it. It's just I, a mentality thing. Uh, you know, when you get stopped out on those days, it's like, oh, I should have sat out. So for me personally, I just trade smaller. Gotcha. All right. Do you have anything else? No. Uh, thanks for having me on and enjoying the podcast so far. Thanks, Ben. Um, another question we had was we have another we have, I have someone typing a question to me, and another one was, and you might recognize this person, but I did not collect names prior to this. But it's hey, coach, how differently would you trade <laughs> if all the capital in your funds was yours personally? So at this point, uh, the only thing I would probably do is experiment a bit more with other strategies uh, specifically now i've said in the past uh that i've taken the uh, portfolio margin trading tactics course by ron bertino over at trading dominion and i took a lot of ideas from the course so i took the course and i instead of trading the strategy specifically i used the ideas to kind of educate myself and evolve and implement what is now the Trinity system that I teach in my podcast, right? And just taking different nuggets and applying that in my own way. But his strategies actually are very advanced and I believe in them, but I didn't have the time to properly test and I didn't want to live test and I don't trade a personal account. And so I think if I had time and if I had personal money, I would actually just start experimenting more with different ideas to, to get confidence in those strategies to scale them up. And now one day I may still do that. But at this point, I think what we already do, you know, what I do with the data engine, with the zero DTE, I'm comfortable with those sizing. Cause obviously um, as a hedge fund manager, I don't just manage other people's money, right? I invest myself into my own funds. So in a way it is my personal capital. It's just, I have other people's capital as well, but I think I've done this so long now and like, I also, I don't think I would be more risky if, if that's kind of the, um, I don't know if that is the implication or not, but like, I, I don't necessarily think I would trade larger or try to be more aggressive. I would kind of do the same thing, but maybe just be a little bit more willing to experiment on the side with other strategies, but do it live. But I don't want to do that live with investor capital. Yeah, that's what I was actually going to follow up and ask you if there was some kind of legal limitation versus or like disclosure rules versus like yeah, having a personal account you can dabble with various exper or experimental strategies in versus like the the pub or not public but the hedge fund account, you know, and so there is no legal limitations uh, to of having there both. There is no limitation on personal account. If it's a personal account, it's just it's separate, right? It's nothing to do with the fund. But I like I said, I don't have a personal account right now. And um, as far as the funds capital, right, our offering documents break down our main strategies and that's basically our mandate. So we can't do anything that deviates from the mandated strategies too much. All right. Another question. So he said, many people do zero DTE, then set stops and leave for the day. And you had mentioned that you can't really walk away after setting the stops. Can you extrapolate and explain more on the idea that they're not able that you're not able to walk away because of risk? Yeah, it's mainly because the stops won't always work the way you think they will, and not just the execution, but literally what can trigger them. And there's there's different kind of stop orders, 
and not just the way the stop orders are set up, but the way they're treated by the exchange or what triggers them. Like a lot of people use these things without even knowing like how they're supposed to function. Now, beyond that, sometimes they can get rejected by the exchange during a fast market or, you know, with the stop limit, right? Because people think stop markets are dangerous, which they are. So they do a stop limit, which is supposed to control the fill. But then if those don't fill and the price goes past, right, you just get blown through. The order will still be there, but you won't have, you know, you'll still be in the position, right? So you don't want to come back uh, and find out that you're stopped in a fill and you have a humongous loss or a full loss on a spread or whatever. And one thing that I want to point out that people, I'm sure they don't realize is a lot of times a stop limit order actually doesn't trigger right away. Sorry, it doesn't fill right away. It triggers, but the price generally moves past your price that you want to fill at and then the market kind of reverts a bit and you fill on the way back. And so there's a lot of times where the order, it looks like it's working fine. And in fact, it is working fine. It's just that it's not working the way you thought it would be. And if that order, if that price had just kept going for a little bit longer or never came back, your order never would have been filled. And so that's kind of the nightmare scenario walking away and coming back and finding out the order either got dropped or didn't fill and you have a humongous loss that's way more than you expected. That's interesting to think or the whenever you said about uh, the stop triggering and not filling until it's on the on the way back down and I never really considered to look at it from like on that from that angle of you know the retrace of whenever you're getting the fill. And yeah, this is the great debate, right? Stop market versus stop limit. Yes. For sure. And, and whether or not you can really uh, be safe when you don't really know what's going to happen. Yes. And I am, and like, and just for me personally, I'm in the camp of stop market because slippage. So to answer this question from a stop market perspective too, is that, you know, like you said, besides the broker rejecting the order outright, there is also the slippage aspect, you know, and then there's um, like Thinkorswim will sometimes have that delay where, you know, you got to contact support and let them know, but there's a window of time there too, correct? Yes, that's right. It's like if you're trying to get some kind of price improvement, well, price improvement might be a customer service thing through uh, Thinkorswim. So there may be some leniency, but like if you're trying to bust a trade, it's, it's 30 minutes is the time limit to call in. Yeah, and and actually, I could tell a quick story too. Is um, one time this is how I discovered that uh, back before I had any kind of um, discipline, I was <laughs> I was selling these massive, massive iron condors, and I guess whenever the number of contracts is over fifty. TD Ameritrade will send the order to the floor to be filled by a human and not electronically. So what happened was I put a stop in, but the it got passed to the floor and the guy the, the floor guy person was trying to fill it as a limit order. Or it, it was like it was all messed up. But in in I was trying to unwind it and I was talking to support and then CBOE ended up busting it and throwing it back. It was a it was a nightmare. And now I have all electronic execution. But it was one of those things where I was competing with a floor trader I didn't even know existed. And there was like this stuff happening behind the scenes at TD Ameritrade to unwind this trade. And then next thing I know, TD Ameritrade is like blowing me up and telling me, hey, you you got an open naked because I set my stops on the short. Like you got an open naked call. Yeah. Wow. That, and fortunately, it was, only, it was only five cents. Like it was worthless. And I asked them, I was like, yo, like, what would have happened in the opposite scenario? Like you got, you know, like this is on you. And they basically just said, we'd work it out. And I've heard that. Whatever before. that means. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Like I can't wait till the next time to, to, to be educated on what that means. <laughs> um, so uh, I have a, another question here and they want to, they want to learn, want to know where they can learn more about being a hedge fund manager. Um, I did a thread on Twitter on how to start a hedge fund. And that thread was actually a rehash of an essay I wrote. So all my trading essays are on my trading page. We can talk about where to find my stuff at the end of the show, I guess. Um, so check out my essay and 
look for my thread on my Twitter. And beyond that, uh, just reach out. I, I can I can help out. It's it's not really that complicated, which is kind of the ironic thing because when I started, maybe I'm just bad at finding information, but like I was going down all kinds of rabbit holes. I almost I, I call like an ETF provider to talk about how the costs are, and that's totally not what a hedge fund is. It's totally different. Um, I started studying for my Series Six and get take the exam to be an RIA. Again, that's not they're not mutually exclusive, but you don't depending on where you are, you don't have to have an RIA to be a hedge fund manager. But yeah, uh, check out my thread. That will kind of give the bare bones, like just a quick intro. And I'm always happy to give some help or refer service providers. Yeah, I don't think it's very obvious because like I was exploring it earlier this year and I spoke to the founder of Repool, which is like hedge fund as a service almost. And um, they bundle it together in a nice little package, but I think you can save probably 50% of the expenses. But if if I would have went the route like detailed in your essay, then we would probably save about 50% of what Repool was going to charge to do it all as like a one, one stop shop type of thing. Wow. Oh, and just to mention, uh, people who are thinking about this, you may not necessarily be having to go the hedge fund route, right? Depending on what you do, you can do manage accounts through TD Ameritrade. You can start an investor club or maybe a fans and friendly account. Like really depending on what, who your audience is and who's going to be your managing money for, like the actual, whatever it is you need to do may, may be different. Yeah, that okay. So, lack of information. We were, I was trying to find clear details on um, interactive brokers has the family and friends account where you never touch the other person's money, you just trade on their behalf, and you can actually bake fees into their into the platform. And I was trying to find more clarification on like family office and what that actually meant because I know it's just like a much less number of people involved or number of investors out, outside capital you can bring in. But I was curious because, yeah, TD Ameritrade has something similar where um, I can trade other accounts using uh, trade authorization forms and Thinkorswim, but they don't have like the fee aspect baked in like interactive brokers do. So there isn't a lot of information out there uh, surrounding the formation of these like financial, per- these fringe. I don't want to say, I don't even want to say fringe, but these, uh, oh, yeah, these alternative financial products. Cause like, yeah, you go on Twitter, you go, down the google rabbit hole like everybody's basically selling the same stuff yeah that's true i I think i see these facebook ads or i turn them off but like these guys trying to sell a course on how to launch a hedge fund i'm sure they charge their arm and a leg and it's probably all basic stuff but yeah definitely there's you gotta watch out for like bad information too Yep. Yeah. I actually, I think I know who you're talking about. So I got caught up in the YouTube videos, man. He young dude, super hype. <laughs> it's, a, it's how it always Yeah. Is. I can't think of his name. I'd, I'd give him a shout out, but I can't think of his name, but, <laughs> uh, but yeah. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? So if not, um, like, or as David was saying, I will put, all of his URLs and information in the podcast description. I'm sure I'll put a tweet out there. I'm sure it'll be out there. It'll definitely be easy to find. Uh, but for the audio listeners, do you want to tell everyone where they can find you, how to get a hold of you, all that good stuff? Yeah. So I'm um, on Twitter. Uh, my handle is the trade buster. So no S just the trade buster singular, but the actual trading page where it houses all my content is, the trade busters with an s.com and that actually just reroutes you to the google sheets that i maintain so don't be surprised if you go there and it's like some janky looking thing that 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 that's it so that google sheets has multiple tabs uh there's links to various uh studies i've done the links to my essays there's even like a podcast guide that has like different podcasts i've kind of listened to and curated and recommend and of course, there's a link to my my own podcast, The Trade Busters. But of course, The Trade Busters itself, just look for The Trade Busters. And that's on all of the major podcast platforms. Uh, I think those are uh, the main places to find my stuff. And if we miss any, we can throw them in the podcast description and everything like that. Sure. So, All right. Well, do you have anything else to add? I don't think there's any other questions. Um, I think the last thing was 
just again about the return on time aspect is when you're trying to design a strategy or figure out what you want to do, just be aware that PNL isn't the only factor, right? Obviously, you, you try to make money, right? But other than risk and profit, you want to consider how this fits in with, and people talk about trading being personal, right? And so they mean different personalities, different risk tolerances. But again, I haven't seen time, availability, or lack thereof as a factor. And so really you can look into different ways of trading that fit with your schedule. And if for those who came in late or and because of the irony of zero DTE being that instant gratification and I don't have to manage overnight trades, but how much time I actually spend right, <laughs> managing the intraday trades versus a longer duration trade, which yes, you have positions on, but there's ways to contain that risk. You know, if you listen to my podcast, all my strategies are there. You can you, you know what I'm talking about. And so ironically, the, the longer data strategies doesn't necessarily mean longer time spent. And this whole idea of like, if you can put in a little bit of effort to get a little bit of extra return, right? If you're not going to hit it out of the park and you're not trying to make 30%, 40% double your account. If you can make a little bit more or beat the market or match the market with the same, you know, less risk, but same return or, you know, same risk, but more return. I mean, depending on what you want to get out of it, but you can, you don't have to spend that much time that in and of itself. And, it's one of those things where I know people get hyped when they first start, like, oh, this, uh, this is going to be great. I'm going to quit my job or whatever. But, like, if you could have your life now and everything is fine and you can spend just a little bit of time on the side and get a little bit of a return and the risk is within your tolerance, that's not such a bad outcome. You don't have to get into this to go live the dream and go click buttons on a beach or something, you know? That's kind of, I think, the takeaway that I want people to have. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good ending note too. Is that you know if you're if you're upset because you're sitting in a cubicle, clenching your fifth eight hours a day, but the trade off is to sit at your house in a in an in a house <laughs> office and clench your fist <laughs> exactly. eight hours a day. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, I just got another question. Uh, can you elaborate more on what kind of strategies are be- where is better time return yeah. is? Or hold on. Can you elaborate more on which kind of strategies would that be where return on time is better? So generally speaking, longer data strategies move slower, and so they don't need as much adjustment. Now, to be clear, not just for zero DT or non-zero DT, but options in general are complex. And I think a lot of the hurdle is really the educational component where you're going to spend so many hours listening to something or studying until you get comfortable. But implementation wise, generally longer data strategies. And if you ever are interested, check out the the PMTT course, their trading strategies at like 120, 150 DTE and the average day in trade is like 60 to 80 days. Right. But again, the key is they're layering trades. So you have multiple positions overlapped and this is a very different style. This is not kind of like the, uh, go out and hunt for an opportunity every day, scanning your scanners and trying to find the opportunity to put on. This is what's called campaign style, where you have a certain mechanic and you're managing your risk. But you, when you're layering positions on, you're managing your book, you're managing your portfolio as opposed to micromanaging. I mean, you are micromanaging the trades, but you're not trying to be like, oh, this trade is a loser. I got to delta hedge and roll this one and this one, whatever. You're, you're looking at the overexposure. And so because the trades move slower, it can be once a day, hey, my position's a little out of skew. I need to adjust some deltas. I do whatever and do it once a day. I, I've, I've heard people because they have like a, their own little Discord or Slack mastermind group and they do meetings. And there's one guy who calls himself like the lazy trader. <laughs> I think he trades like once a week or something, right? And so if you really just think about that, I, I think people may not even have kind of imagined that this is possible. Um, that you can really have something where you're comfortable not touching it for like days at a time. And that's, you know, when you minimize that time spent, right, that's maximizing the return on time. And that's kind of the, the, the aspect that, that I think is uh, for me, is very unique. 
All right. Good stuff, man. All right. I appreciate you coming on. And uh, like, like David said, trade busters with an S dot com or at the trade buster with no S on Twitter. And uh, I highly recommend we didn't really plug the discord because it's not really one of those. Uh, it's not very obvious, but I do want to recommend that if you go into David's podcast and you like what he's talking about and you kind of relate to what he, you know, you, you, you like the uh, ideas that he's putting out there, definitely shoot him an email for the uh, discord link. Um, never paid. It's uh, what do we charge? What do you say you charge? We charge time? four hours. And it's basically so whatever your hourly rate is, that's your cost. <laughs> Everything is always time. <laughs> so you got to value your time, and that's how I value it. So the return on time of listening to these podcasts, joining the Discord is, is it's a yeah, great I return so. on time, yeah, in my opinion. Point. Yeah, and and I, yeah, and I and I I just wanted to kind of put it out there because it is a great, it's an awesome community, and we and the return on time aspect of it is really just to make sure everybody's on the same page and we don't run into that confusion that we had touched on earlier, where is it return on buying power, return on capital, return on, you know? So, um, yeah, I just wanted to put it out there again and I appreciate you coming on. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Talk to you guys next time.